Mr. Wallace, who's presently serving 10 years for manslaughter in an English jail, was known to have links with British intelligence. Wallace claimed he was an intelligence officer. Wallace alleges he became involved in a black propaganda campaign by the security services. There was no evidence to support the claims of Mr. Colin Wallace. Until anybody can produce proper evidence, there is no need to have an inquiry. Colin Wallace had fractured Mr. Lewis's skull with a karate-style blow after he was accused of having an affair with Mr. Lewis's wife. He hid his friend's body in the boot of his car and later dumped it in the River Arran. He says he was the victim of an MI5 dirty tricks campaign. The IRD, as a foreign office department, had to justify their position in Northern Ireland. And they justified it by emphasising the international links of the IRA, by saying this is to do with Ireland, this is to do with the communists. And oddly, this is to do with the Vatican City as well, playing at the Catholic angle. The IRD tended to work through newspapers. They would draft articles in London and then distribute them through friendly journalists to slip into foreign newspapers. They worked with publishing houses where they would um, write some book about communism and then it would be distributed or published through a private commercial company. Hugh Mooney of the IRD was sent as an advisor to information policy. Northern Ireland was the most surveyed country in the world. Every citizen probably had a file. Every household was under surveillance, down to minute things like extra pint of milk. Just bought a new TV, where's the money come from that? Colin Wallace, a 27-year-old army press officer, was asked to assist the psychological warfare unit. Because I grew up in Northern Ireland, because I knew a lot of the background, I was then asked to explain some of the significance in terms of uh, emblems in terms of labels and so on and so forth. I was really bringing into the PSYOPs team the Irish dimension, as it were, in terms of history, emotion, symbols, sounds. Maurice Tugwell, the head of the Army Psychological Warfare School and a veteran of Britain's colonial counterinsurgency campaigns, commanded the PSYOPs unit. Maurice Tugwell believed that all information agencies in Northern Ireland should speak with one voice. Any organisation critical of British policy was an IRA front. Information policy, PSYOPs, was a highly sensitive activity and it really needed some form of cover that gave uh, its officers access to the public and the press. Information policy was in the same building, on the same corridor, as the press office. So a visiting journalist going down the corridor to the press office would uh, almost see the whole corridor as part of Army Public Relations, or as a key part of that um, had no bearing on public relations per se. On the 9th of August 1971, the British government approved the internment of dissidents without trial. Many of those imprisoned were not terrorists, but civil rights activists and Irish nationalists. The perception at that stage was a bad one globally. And of course, the IRA were very good from a PSYOP's point of view. They used that to make Britain look bad. Reports of torture surfaced in the Irish press. Were there allegations of brutality? The information policy unit uh, planted with selected journalists the fact that the techniques used uh, by the security forces in questioning TNEs were actually less demanding than the techniques we used on our own soldiers when we were 
teaching them how to avoid or deal with interrogation if they were captured by the enemy. Stories of torture and arbitrary imprisonment without trial fanned feelings of historical injustice. And with that, the popularity of the IRA increased. The violence from all sides escalated. In 1972, 479 people were killed and almost 5,000 injured. Each day, the psychological operations team would look at the violence of the past 24 hours. Some activities would require a quick response. We needed to do something that day. But sometimes there were themes developing that, for example, some type of terrorist activity uh, was creating a problem. And therefore, we would have to take a more strategic look at that. A theme was a broad issue that information policy identified as a concern. Major themes included community support for paramilitary organizations who were portrayed as organized criminal groups that intimidated and exploited local communities. Information policy attempted to spread uncertainty and conflict in target groups. The international perception of the conflict was another major theme. Themes were used to colour events with a message that supported information policy's long-term PSYOPs campaigns. When journalists visited or phoned the Army press office, they would be passed through to Colin Wallace and his colleagues. We then, from a PSYOPs point of view, either had an agreed uh, position which we would take on as feeding in the various themes that we wanted to put across, or in certain cases, uh, we had a number of journalists who were uh, much more pro the role of the armed forces in Northern Ireland, and we would then um, call them direct and explain the background that we wanted to put across. The propaganda was deliberately designed to create conflict, to disorientate the IRA, to unnerve them and to, again, to separate them from the community uh, whose support they needed in order to make, remain a, a viable organisation. We discovered at one stage they were using um, natural benzene to mix with fertiliser to make their bombs more effective. We discovered that nitrobenzene had a carcinogenic uh, quality and therefore there was a real danger that people mixing these explosives, unless they were protected properly, uh, were likely to develop cancer at a later stage. Now, this was a scientific fact, but uh, exactly how much exposure, etc., we had no idea. But because there were sufficient um, scientific hooks with that, we circulated that information to the press. And the good thing about it was lots of um, experts from the scientific world uh, agreed uh, with the conclusion that uh, nitrobenzene was a carcinogenic. Newspapers picked up the story and quoted an anonymous army spokesperson who was none other than Colin Wallace, who claimed that symptoms of nitro poisoning are difficult to spot. By the time they are visible, it is too late to treat the victim. Vomiting and a coma follow, and later the glands and liver break down. The Guardian reported children finding it stored in a derelict house or people forced to store it by the provisionals could suffer from the poisoning. On occasion, uh, bombs would go off prematurely, and quite often the people transporting the bomb would be killed. And um, where we got a bomb going off prematurely, although we knew the reason uh, from the subsequent examination of the device, uh, why it had gone off prematurely, we would quite often try to shift uh, the reason for that onto something else. In campaigns of a more political nature, Army PSYOPs worked with Hugh Mooney of the IRD. One of the themes the IRD used in its propaganda was trying to link the IRA to the Soviet Union and the broader communist um, threat. And so one of their plans involved telling 
journalists or leaking a story that Soviet submarines were dropping subversives who had been trained by the KGB off the coast of Ireland. IRD acquired at one stage some photographs that the Royal Air Force had taken of a Soviet submarine off the coast of Scotland. Uh, a dossier was then built up by IRD, creating uh, you know, a credible story that uh, this submarine, which then had moved off the coast of Donegal rather than Scotland from the story point of view, that this was clear evidence that the Soviets were directly involved in the violence in Northern Ireland. Um, so IRD set up uh, a meeting with the News of the World in London. We took across photographs, various other documents and uh, material to substantiate the story. Uh, this was given to the News of the World who ran the, as a front page lead. It was a, a huge story and it, it got wide circulation again um, around the world. Hugh Mooney identified himself to the journalist as a member of the Foreign Office. The Foreign Office was a cover for the activities of IRD and therefore he was listed as a senior member of the Foreign Office and that's how they knew that uh, he was a genuine official. We would try to manipulate the terrorist organisation simply by information just to delay and get them to lose faith in what they were doing. But at the other end of the scale, there may be a technical intervention where, again, one would try to get, uh, for example, a weapon to misfire or to explode or something of that nature. On one occasion, the IRA was struggling with using heavier weapons such as bazookas. And it turned out that they were using them with the safety cap still on. The IRD decided to conceal this explanation and instead issue a dummy army order um, suggesting that uh, the shells be tested electronically. The IRD hoped that this would result in explosions going off in the hands of IRA members. In Northern Ireland, a clandestine unit, the Military Reaction Force, dressed up as civilians and injured and killed numerous Catholics in drive-by shootings. Information policy would point out to journalists that the weapons used were those that the paramilitary groups carried. As a result, the press attributed the attacks to the paramilitary groups. In one incident, the police discovered that an undercover army unit had injured a group of people at a bus stop in a drive-by shooting on the Glen Road in Belfast. The police wanted to press charges. PSYOPs dissuaded the police by threatening to reveal that the ammunition used had been given to the army by the police. Information policy established close relationships with journalists and their publications. The whole thing is about knowing the target audience, but also knowing the journalists as well. Sometimes, um, you know, the relationship was was very good, and it was almost at a, at a humorous level. And journalists might ring me up and say, "Look, um, I'm quoting you as saying this," and I would say, "But I didn't say that." And they say, "I know, but we knew you would say that." And it was at that level, unless unless that quote was really way off mark, I would be quite happy with that. 99% of the work I was doing was unattributable. And then you also have off-the-record information which you know, a journalist would know but couldn't actually uh, report on. So uh, literally that would uh, just be built into their story with, without any reference to where it came from. Professional journalists are very good because they realised that if they didn't actually stick by what is a journalistic agreement after all, then uh, probably we would not cooperate with them in the same way in the future. How important is it for PSYOPs to be believable? The press have quite often said that uh, PSYOPs was largely about propaganda and using disinformation. But in the vast majority of cases, we were working on real intelligence. So real intelligence is much more powerful because when the terrorists check out their own sources, it has to be credible. They have to be able to stand it up. If they can show it's false, then of course it's a waste of time and it really doesn't go anywhere. So most of the material that we used, most effective stuff, um, was 
genuine intelligence and had to be credible, not just from a journalist's point of view, but it had to also be credible from a terrorist's point of view. On the 5th of August, 1973, an article in the Belfast Sunday News reported that sheep had been sacrificed in a black magic ritual on Copeland Island Beach, northeast of Belfast. It was a front page headline in the Sunday News, which lots of people read. The story was that sheep had been ritually killed and mutilated. That was the story. And that it was, it was Satanists who had, done, who had done this. As a would-be anthropologist and undergraduate at the time, it tweaked my, uh, my, my interests and I began to pay attention as other news stories appeared in other local papers. The more I looked, the more I found, and I began to be really surprised at the degree to which this had been a newspaper, a local newspaper story in Northern Ireland. From August 1973, stories of witchcraft and black magic began to surface in many local newspapers. The first thing that I had to do was try and understand what um, witchcraft would look like, and we had no idea. So I bought a book on the subject. Then the whole idea of the sacrifice of animals or whatever it might have been, we got uh, blood from the uh, cookhouse, from the army cookhouse, and we would scatter that over the uh, makeshift altars that were there. Um, some of that material then we left and um, it would be discovered by local people and then eventually uh, they would talk about it at the press. And gradually the story built up and built up over a, a period of months. This was um, a way of really getting the interest of the press, getting rumours going around and therefore doing the things that we really wanted to happen. The ritual sites were often located in old graveyards and abandoned properties. You have to remember that this was a time in Northern Ireland when all kinds of unusual things were happening. Assassinations were a very regular thing and some of them were particularly bloody and brutal. Torture, mutilation, using knives and blades and things like that. People were talking about ritual murders and all kinds of things. So. All of a sudden, all of the moral certainties no longer seem to be quite just as certain. Information policy sent fake readers' letters to the local press to help fan the rumours. Quite often, uh, on different subjects, we would write to uh, local newspapers uh, drawing attention to something or criticising something and then um, the newspaper would publish that. and it would, it would usually be about a local issue and it was very much done at local level. But then we would pick up the publication of those letters and we would then circulate those letters to more to the national press to reflect what would be portrayed as local views. Don't forget that we're not just influencing the press. The press is only one way of influencing the public. We had to be able to influence all sorts of other people who were, um, you know, communicating with um, the, the, their, the public. And the churches then, in the 70s, had much more influence, of course, than they have today. And therefore, this involvement of witchcraft was quite important. The key thing we wanted the Protestant, uh, sorry, we wanted the clergy to do, I think, was just to try and go back to um, reject all types of violence and questionable behaviour. And whether that was drugs or witchcraft or terrorism, um, it was to say that these activities really have no place in the society that we were trying to create. And because at that stage, people's world was dominated by the fear of terrorism, um, we were directly linking a lot of these things together. It was important to look at evil, bad, and terrorism all within one package. They were particularly interested in getting at the Protestant population and getting them to believe in this stuff. They were trying to scare the bejesus out of the local population and to attach that fright to the terrible things that were going on, ergo the paramilitaries. That's, I think, 
what the core job of what they were doing was. They were trying to discredit the paramilitaries. They were trying to associate them with bad things, drug dealing, dodgy financial dealings, etc., etc. We were just saying, look, the fact that the community has now sort of dissolved into this violence, which is becoming more and more sadistic in terms of sectarian assassinations, you know, where do you draw a halt as a community? I think it helped to bring home to people that th there was something going on in their community that really uh, was not good for them as a whole. That is a strange way of thinking because, you know, you are part of the army and the idea is that you are fighting a war. But you are saying the witchcraft campaign was about bringing a sense of morality back to the community. You wouldn't really have thought that the army would think about that. Uh, probably not, but I think, you see, it, it is a war, but it's not a conventional war. Terrorism is fundamentally a propaganda war that is backed up by armed conflict. So it was, um, it was just, I think, going back to say to people, you know, you have grown up, as I did in Northern Ireland, with a very strong belief in the community and in our own church, whatever that religion was. And surely we have drifted a long way from that as a result of the violence of the last five, six years. On the 8th of September, 1973, the burnt and mutilated body of 10-year-old Brian McDermott was discovered by the River Lagan in Belfast. People began to speculate, was this a black magic killing? And it certainly contributed towards one of the threads in the, the rumours and fears that autumn, which was that Satanists were looking for children to abduct. Newspapers reported rumours that a boy or girl under seven would be sacrificed the police actually issued statements saying they believed that the murder may have involved witchcraft. I was a concern for us at that stage because bearing in mind that we were creating this concept, uh, at that point we stopped using uh, witchcraft as a, as a concept. But that was in September and according to Richard Jenkins, the witchcraft scare continued all the way to the beginning of 1974. I think that's right, and one of the points we were making is that when you create a story, it gathers momentum over a period of time. And I think although we stopped doing things, there were lots of other stories and rumours going around. And there may also have been people, you know, creating these things for fun, really, to, to do that. But we certainly stopped uh, after Brian Dermot's death. There's no doubt about that, I'm absolutely clear. But it may well be that the aftermath of that was still going on for a period of some time, um, even to the beginning of the following year. From early September to December 1973, there were more than 70 articles referring to black magic and witchcraft. By the beginning of the following year, the topic had almost completely vanished from the press. When the British Prime Minister Harold Wilson visited Northern Ireland, he was briefed by Colin Wallace. Would the Prime Minister have been aware that you were in fact in military intelligence? Oh, I don't believe they would have been. I'm sure he saw me simply as an army press officer. Did you yourself have a brief for when you interacted with him? Yes, what happened uh, was that there were certain key things that we felt the prime minister should know. So the idea is that you don't want him to be wrong-footed by not being able to answer uh, the basic questions about security in Northern Ireland. Influencing the press, the clergy and key decision makers was one aspect of psychological warfare. Another was influencing persons of interest directly. Quite often we were trying to influence people where we had no direct access to them. <laughs> 
And so while you're trying to move somebody or change somebody's thinking, sometimes you had to target them through one or more sort of relays of other people. So it's never straight communication. A lot of information we were disseminating wasn't through the media, it was also through people. And therefore they had to be cut out so that the person handling it quite often didn't realize who the originator was. And that made it all the more credible when that person who was known to the target was passing us information on to them. Information policy created profiles of persons of interest and people in their social networks. The key thing was that when you knew a lot about a person and the people they worked with, like any other part of society, there were people who didn't like each other, there were people who were jealous of each other. Because we had the relevant intelligence, if we could plant it in the right way, you could, for example, if one person was suspicious, suspicious of another for some reason, you could increase that suspicion by feeding information then that would tend to reinforce their own views of that individual. So it was that type of activity. Could you explain more about the kind of techniques you used to create psychological conflict? I have to be careful with that because what I don't want to do is actually share techniques that are still having impact. And so there's a, there's a grey area there, but it's basically along the lines that we're saying, first of all, is to identify um, relationships look at how toxic those relationships or not may be, and then try to maneuver them by planning information and to uh, have that effect. You build up quite a comprehensive profile of that person and their um, uh, associates. Now, it may be that some of those associates are totally innocent of any involvement in terrorism whatsoever. They just happen to be good friends from school days and so on and so forth that's really creating a picture of that person so you almost know what their response will be to something that you do. This is a very different use of psychology and I think a lot of people wouldn't be aware that this knowledge exists and that people study psychology you know for these kinds of purposes. I think that's true but it, you have to be careful because we did do lots of things that had a positive psychological effect. Like, for example, we ran youth clubs, we ran community relations. I was the Army's father at Christmas, going around schools and hospitals at Christmas. We actually provided funds for projects. We took kids away from the really bad areas of Northern Ireland, from opposite sides of the fence, Catholic and Protestant together, we took them away to the mountains camping. Colin Wallace was refused clearance to target high-ranking Protestant paramilitaries in psychological operations. These individuals, who at times colluded with the British Army, were on an excluded list. A number of Protestant clergy and politicians, on the other hand, were legitimate targets. PSYOPs targeted individuals who were not members of terrorist organisations, but who had influence in communities of interest to PSYOPs. In the Catholic community, personal conflicts were the most common reason for a person to become an informant. We couldn't admit to what we were doing, the army didn't admit to what we were doing, and so on and so forth. A senior figure, political or military, might ask us to do something. And then for political reasons, usually, they would say, it would be a really good idea if X happened. Uh, but then they would quite often say, but I don't want you to tell me how you go about it because I may have to deny it. And that was a classic example. So in other words, the person doesn't want to lie, but they were involved in it. Senior figures were deliberately kept in the dark about the specifics of campaigns, so that they could deny involvement should they be called upon to answer questions. At the age of 29, Colin Wallace was the youngest senior information officer in the MOD. During his time in information policy, he was put forward for New Year's honours three times by his superiors. In 1973, 
the IRD was withdrawn from Northern Ireland. The IRD focused on framing conflicts both at home and abroad as part of a clash of ideologies between communism and the West. Army intelligence saw the IRD as involved in political propaganda of limited relevance to their anti-terror and counterinsurgency campaign. The military feared that having the IRD in Northern Ireland was undermining the credibility of their own PR campaigns. And Lisbon, the army headquarters, was becoming known as the Lisbon lie machine. Not long after the departure of Hugh Mooney and the IRD, a meeting was convened at Stormont Castle, the headquarters of MI5 in Northern Ireland. At this meeting, a campaign codenamed Clockwork Orange was launched. Colin Wallace was asked to liaise with an operative by the cover name John Shaw. He never came to Army headquarters at any time when I was there. All the meetings I had with them were at the White Gables Hotel. And I think the idea with that was that there would be no direct link, particularly with some of the information that we were using, between him and the Army. Colin Wallace alleges John Shaw supplied him with material that included smears on politicians from the three main political parties in Britain. Why do you think you were given that information, considering the sensitivity of it? No, as I say, this was background, because if we're looking at, for example, the increase in violence, that has to be put in context, particularly if you're bri briefing journalists in depth or foreign journalists. So you have to explain at that stage what led up to the violence. So in other words, the violence was really the activity, but the background was coming from the briefing papers that I was given. Some of the forgeries that information policy and MI5 and IRD concocted in Northern Ireland came into my possession. To Merlin Rees, who at one point was the Minister for Northern Ireland, this is apparently from the American Congress for Irish Freedom, 1971. This was an IRA from in America. This is a letter apparently thanking Merlin Rees for his support which, of course, Merlin Rees didn't support it, but there you go. According to Stephen Dorrell, some of the smears Colin Wallace received from John Shaw were already in circulation in Britain. Britain had a very sophisticated system whereby there were scores of people around the country whose job it was just to sit in bars, coffee bars, talk to people, uh, go to uh, clubs, and spread rumours and gradually kind of build up this idea about someone or some operation. It was smears about sex, accusations that uh, Wilson had affairs. The British Prime Minister, Harold Wilson, had been sexually compromised on a trip to Moscow. There were accusations about, which is again kind of interesting in retros retrospect, about him being too close to Jewish uh, people. So there were kind of anti-Semitic smears that Wilson was corrupt, that he had secret bank accounts. A few years ago, the son of a MI6 officer contacted me and said, um, you've written about my father, but did you know that when he retired in 1970, he went into the city of London and he started a newsletter and spread rumours through this newsletter and smears about Wilson. Here's another fake, a Swiss account held by uh, Edward Short, who was the leader of the House of Commons at the time, I think, another Labour MP, a fake bank account showing he had £30,000. A journalist who trusts somebody like Colin can easily be manipulated. He would say to somebody, OK, yeah, I think I know so-and-so, talk to that person, or I can supply you with this bit of information, or I have this document I will allow you to look at, which will back up what I am saying, or what, the, what this person has told you. It's a very sophisticated kind of system. This is thought out about what it is you want to achieve with this particular story. Um, this might be part of a chain. It might be part of an operation that's ongoing with the idea that you kind of sway the argument or you change the view of something, uh, smear somebody. In October 1974, at a meeting with John Shaw, 
Colin Wallace demanded proof of political clearance for Clockwork Orange. He never saw or heard from John Shaw again. Colin Wallace turned his attention to undermining the Republican support network in the US and Ireland. He created a dossier that linked fundraisers and businessmen supportive of Republicans to weapons smuggling. Colin Wallace traced the serial numbers of weapons captured in Belfast to arms dealers in the US. He identified a leading fundraiser and major benefactors. The story was intended as an exclusive for a major publication. The Irish Joint Section of MI5 and MI6 reported in a telegram that the managing editor of the Daily Telegraph was prepared to give the article wide coverage. Colin Wallace was asked to supply additional photographs. Information Policy ran a photography department that gathered images for intelligence purposes. These images could be used as supporting material in press briefings. The Daily Telegraph published a special investigation. Reporter Christopher Dobson wrote, I have spent the last two months investigating the way in which the IRA gets its money. I have travelled to the United States and Ireland in tracking back the serial numbers of arms captured in Belfast, and I have looked into the lives of the paymasters of terror. The press helped information policy to target individuals and organisations to which PSYOPs had no direct access due to their geographic location. The article provided no evidence of the funding or smuggling of arms. However, the reader was left with the distinct impression that the individuals and organisation highlighted were responsible. William McGrath was a prominent individual in Loyalist politics, the Church and the Orange Order, and the head of an organisation called Tara. I was asked to encourage the press to look at what Tara and McGrath were all about. Tara um, was an organisation that was really designed to prepare for a doomsday situation by Loyalists if um, they, there was a, an IRA campaign or in fact, as McGrath said, the Irish army might even in, in, invade the North. Attending the meetings of Tara, there were members of the Ulster Volunteer Force, which was then a prescribed Loyalist paramilitary group. And there were also police officers attending it. In 1973, McGrath issued a proclamation. It was designed to make the Roman Catholic Church illegal William McGrath was also the housemaster of Kincora, a home for boys from troubled backgrounds between the ages of 11 to 18. Colin Wallace issued three separate briefings on McGrath. The press did not follow up the story. The army was informed by Special Branch that if they moved against McGrath, it would be a great propaganda coup for the IRA and significantly damage the political structure in Northern Ireland. In December 1974, Colin Wallace was summoned to the Ministry of Defence in London. Everything, as far as I was concerned, in terms of my job, uh, how I was regarded by annual per performance reports, all of those things were perfect. And so I was a bit surprised to be told then by uh, the senior MOD official who saw me that because my life was in danger, I had to be moved out of the province. A farewell party was organised. A prominent cartoonist recorded Colin Wallace's departure. I moved to my new post and a day after that, a police officer from Northern Ireland arrived with a special branch officer and said that uh, they were investigating the fact that I had given a restricted document to a journalist. For the past six years, I'd been supplying you know, as part of my job description, highly sensitive information to journalists from different countries around the world. Unbeknown to Colin Wallace, MI5 had made an assessment that he was disgruntled and a security risk. The disciplinary hearing that followed concluded that Colin Wallace should be dismissed, but that he could keep his pension if he resigned voluntarily. 
Peter Broderick, a colleague of Colin Wallace's in Army Public Relations, tried to support him, and was informed that Colin Wallace was a member of a terrorist organisation. Peter Broderick was then transferred out of the Ministry of Defence. When uh, my disciplinary hearing was finished, I realised that um, clearly it had been rigged and I then engaged the solicitor purely for personal protection to tell him what had happened to me. He said that uh, he was involved in um, uh, dirty tricks against politicians in Northern Ireland. And he also said that this had now started to move over onto the mainland and that he was involved in a dirty tricks campaign against mainland politicians, uh, and in particular, he mentioned Harold Wilson. Colin Wallace moved to South East London and began to speak out about his work in information policy. He lobbied MPs, supplied information to the press, and wrote to the former Prime Minister. Harold Wilson already held suspicions that MI5 had undermined him and his government, and had communicated this to two journalists. He thought they'd mounted a campaign of denigrating him personally, of using official material that had been gathered and then misused by, by, by leaking it to newspapers. They released a book which was largely ignored. In 1977, the IRD was quietly closed down after an internal investigation into the plot against the former Prime Minister. I corresponded with Lord Hunt. He was asked to carry out the investigation into the alleged plots against Harold Wilson. And he spoke to a number of people, including the heads of MI5 and MI6. And he said that there was a plot, that there were dissident elements within um, both organisations. He wrote that report, which went to the new Prime Minister, and a copy of it was supposed to have been deposited in the Cabinet Office. I asked the Cabinet Office where was the copy, and they said they could not find one. Colin Wallace, unaware of the demise of the IRD, began a new life in West Sussex. In January 1980, the Irish Independent published an article on the abuse of boys at the Belfast Boys' Home, Kincora. The house fathers William McGrath, Joseph Maines and Raymond Semple had been sexually abusing the boys in their care. Politicians in Northern Ireland demanded a full inquiry. The body which was found last Friday in the river uh, had head injuries and this is a matter for the pathologist who is making this examination to find out whether in fact the person died as a result of drowning or as a result of the head injuries. Colin Wallace had fractured Mr Lewis's skull with a karate style blow during a meeting at his house after he was accused of having an affair with Mr. Lewis's wife. He hid his friend's body in the boot of his car and later dumped it in the River Arran. Colin Wallace was charged with the murder. The prosecution alleged he was infatuated with Jane Lewis, the deceased's wife. He was found guilty of manslaughter and sentenced to 10 years on the 20th of March, 1981. Sixty-five-year-old house father William McGrath, seen here in the foreground. He ran two Bible study centres in Belfast in the 50s and 60s. McGrath was also a founding member of the Protestant paramilitary group Tara. This man was one of McGrath's victims. And he would come up like you're getting dressed. And then he'd start doing things he don't like, you know, he says. And uh, so one time I was bleeding, I told him to stop. It wasn't pleasant, like this. He couldn't turn to no one, you know. One of the Army's former press officers at Thiepville Barracks in Lisburn, Colin Wallace, is now a key figure in the Concora investigation. Mr Wallace, who's presently serving 10 years for manslaughter in an English jail, was also known to have links with British intelligence. Kevin Dowling, exactly what did Colin Wallace tell you in 1973? 
Um, he certainly said that uh, McGrath was a homosexual. You must remember that the conversation I had with him was in 1973. Um, I don't remember the conversation entirely clearly. It has been suggested to me that McGrath uh, was in fact some kind of an army informer and that the, uh, the police felt obliged to protect him in order to bring to book greater criminals than he. Exactly what part did British intelligence play and were they aware that William McGrath was employed at Concora? British Army files relating to the Kinkora Boys' Home disappeared from Army headquarters. It was rumoured that William McGrath was an MI5 informant. McGrath, Mains and Semple, who ran the Kinkora Boys' Home, were sentenced in December 1981. All were released in under two years. Meanwhile, Colin Wallace was still only at the beginning of his 10-year sentence. When I first got to know him, he was in prison, and it was bizarre. He was actually protected in prison. There were pr other prisoners believed him, and he actually had kind of bodyguards, because they thought, probably correctly, that he might be killed, assassinated in prison. Clive Ponting was head of the legal department at the Ministry of Defence in 1983 and remembers a meeting with MI5 where Colin Wallace was discussed. There was never any suspicion that Wallace was making these stories up and it was all totally unfounded and very easy to rubbish. It was very much a matter that, um, OK, that the story was being contained at the moment because he was in jail, but that in a few years' time he would be back out again and could be expected to start making the allegations again. One evening in prison, Colin Wallace read an article about Fred Holroyd, a former military intelligence officer in Northern Ireland, whose experience bore some resemblance to his own. Colin wrote a letter to Fred asking for help. When I got to the prison, I realised this was the same man that I'd met in the secret corridor who had a, 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 an office in army headquarters. The MOD repeatedly were refuting that it was anything more and a civilian clerk with a Walter Mitty complex. And yet here he is with an office in this secret corridor with the political officer, MI5, MI6. All of the people who were running the army were in that office. I went on the same day the murder was committed. At the same time, you know, you've got every man and his dog walking along that path. You've got fishermen overlooking it about 100 yards away on a bridge. You have all sorts of courting couples walking along and Boats going up and down the river. The thing was, you know, Trafalgar Square on a Saturday. The story that the police had put out was, uh, was a lie. I also discovered a witness who had seen the dead man uh, after he'd allegedly been killed by Colin. The police persuaded her not to give evidence. He was sitting by the window um, with the gentleman he was with, a man in approximately his 50s with thinning grey hair combed back over the top of his head. And as far as I remember, I think he was in a grey suit. Whatever exchange came from Jonathan Lewis, it was sharp and then back to looking at it and fiddling with his glass on his knee. He looked far from happy. She was frightened of the police. She thought the police were in on this. Fred Holroyd doorsteps the boatman who had found the body. And he didn't know who I was. They all get very frightened when I arrive and start asking him questions about things that they're, that they're worried about themselves. And he said, oh, I can tell you that the buggers wouldn't let me give the evidence I wanted to give, which was you know, that I'd, I'd reversed back and my propeller had hit the guy in the face, and that's what caused the wound. And I said, you're kidding. You know, he said, no. So I said, are you prepared to put that down in writing? He said, well, if I have to, but the best thing would be to get me in a court and ask me questions, and then I have to answer in a courtroom, and the police can't do me any harm. When Colin was still in prison, he was via his solicitor. He was sending out various documents that he'd written I was unemployed, and in those days in Hull, in Mrs Thatcher's Britain, in a place like Hull with unemployment at 10%, if you had something to do, and I did, the people on the door would leave, ignore you for years. So I carried on doing this journalism stuff. Lobster, an obscure magazine made on a photocopier with a circulation of 150, co-founded and co-edited by Ramsey and Dorrell, may at the time have been the only publication in Britain to take Colin Wallace's allegations seriously. I wrote this, which was, you know, 50 pages, an attempt to explain Colin's story. 
We printed quite a lot of these, about a thousand copies, I think. And we went to London and had a press conference. So two, two hicks from the sticks turn up carrying this complicated, this big document and say, here's a big story. The, the media were not impressed at all. Virtually no response to it. In January 1987, Colin Wallace was released from prison. A journalist called Julian O'Halloran went to Lewis Prison, actually filmed Colin Wallace as he stepped out of the prison gate and interviewed him. And it was going to be broadcast on Newsnight. I was actually watching Newsnight when there was a great kerfuffle in the studio. Something had happened and bits of paper were being looked at and headphones were being checked. And what had happened was the Wallace segment had been yanked at the last minute by a man called Alan Prothero, who at that point was deputy director of the BBC. Prothero was a part-time army officer in the Territorial Army, and his speciality was media-military relations. I went down to visit him and Fred, and it was the middle of winter, we were sitting in Colin Walsh's unheated house. He'd come out of prison and he couldn't afford to heat it. And uh, so we're all sitting in our, in our coats in Colin's living room, and I remember saying something like, so your plan is that me and you two guys, with no money between us, are going to take on MI5 and the MOD. Yes, that's the plan, they said. Irish broadcaster RTE picked up the story. The record says that Colin Wallace killed Jonathan Lewis. Oh, yes, absolutely. Did but you? I, no, I didn't. I had nothing at all to do with his death. I wasn't involved in any way. But, I mean, if I'm not calm about it, if I panic about it, I create a fuss, I get excited about it, that's not going to change the verdict any quicker than if I stay calm and deal with it properly through the correct channels. Eventually I was hired by Channel 4 News. Colin had these handwritten notes that he claimed what he'd written down from this, about this MI5 disinformation project against the lab, mostly against Labour MPs. Robert Parker of Channel 4 News went to a forensic scientist called Dr Julius Grant. What chances do you think there are that these notes are forgeries? Well, from what I've already said, the chances that they're forgeries seem to be uh, rather remote. And thus, these documents were in fact written, probably, when Wallace said they were written. While we were working together on bits and pieces about Wallace, uh, another journalist in ITN, who was one of their crime correspondents, began feeding information he was getting from the MOD, the Ministry of Defence, denigrating Wallace. We were also getting similar stuff from um, Professor Paul Wilkinson, a terrorism expert, again denigrating Wallace and saying he's a fantasist and a liar. Investigative journalist Paul Foote wrote a book about Colin Wallace. Wallace began to appear in the British media more frequently, including on popular ITV weekly debate show Central Weekend Live. If you take the case of Mr. Wallace here, as everybody else who's ever convicted of any crime, poor Mr. It's Wallace it's was framed. Right. I don't but believe he was framed. But the point that it's he made. Any responsible journalist in Northern Ireland in the early 70s knew what Colin Wallace was up to. There was this gung-ho character who was running around at dead of night, shoving envelopes full of documents into the letterboxes of journalists. And you'd say, there's Colin's at it again. I, for one, I was the first, probably the first person in the CIA who got into this dirty tricks business. They weren't as dirty as a lot of people. Yeah, because a lot of people find it very objectionable. But it wasn't just a minute. It's a, to, to, to blacken someone's a hell of a lot better than killing. In World War II, we killed people. <laughs> and then now, when we got into business, well, we were simply playing dirty tricks again to prevent having World War III. You're, you're the man that sparked all this off. I did not uh, join the security forces to discredit the Labour Party, the Conservative Party, the Liberal Party. And because I was deflected from my main job into doing political disinformation, I was not actually doing the job I joined to do. Good evening. A civil servant sacked after making allegations about an MI5 dirty tricks campaign has been awarded £30,000 compensation by the government. Wilkert QC was asked to conduct an inquiry. In his report, he reveals that Ministry of Defence officials contacted Mr Wallace's disciplinary hearing beforehand, thus influencing the outcome. The Defence Secretary, Tom King, asked Mr Culcott not to write a full report. Labour's Northern Ireland Secretary between 1974 and 76 said he had been the victim of a dirty tricks campaign. Who instructed Mr Wallace to do the job that he and others did? That's what we've got to know. We want to be sure that this sort of thing never happens again. I feel very strongly about it. 
Mrs Thatcher, having insisted there was no evidence to back such claims, was forced to admit in the Commons that she'd been misled. This followed the discovery of documents in the Ministry of Defence which related to a propaganda campaign codenamed Clockwork Orange. He's calling for the government to launch a full inquiry. And justice to me is really a minor matter. The much more important matters are the allegations that there was an attempt to um, influence the general elections in 1974 and indeed the assaults on the children from Cora during the 70s. Um, my aspect of the story really is only a minor one by comparison. And the government specifically ruled out the reopening of the investigation into the alleged cover-up of the homosexual abuse of boys at the Kinkora home in Belfast. Information about homosexual behaviour at the Kinkora boys' home was used to blackmail prominent figures in Northern Ireland. After I left Northern Ireland, another intelligence officer came in called Brian Gimmel. He was told about the allegations surrounding uh, the abuses at Kinkora. He wrote a report about them. He submitted that report to a senior MI5 officer, Ian Cameron, who then told him to stop investigating. You know, on the phone, we got phone calls of generals said, yes, they, I knew all about King Corps, I was told, and I took it to MI5, and they said it was none of my business, and I left it to them. It was their business. And, and all this sort of stuff, and you know, the realization, like me, the light is dawning, that we are not who we say we are. Journalist David Lay tracks down Dennis Payne, the former head of MI5 in Northern Ireland, to a sleepy village in the countryside and confronted him with the Clockwork Orange allegations. I'm under an obligation to say absolutely nothing. I've not, I, I, I can't say anything at all. I mean, um, you collect all the information. I can't even lose in the slightest bit interested in it, but um, I have nothing to add. In 1996, Colin Wallace appealed his conviction for manslaughter. Today, 15 years after he was jailed for manslaughter, Colin Wallace from West Sussex cleared his name. He served six years in the 1980s after being found guilty of killing an antique dealer near his home in West Sussex. During the appeal hearing, the Home Office pathologist admitted that a Secret Service agent had suggested to him that the injury was caused by a karate chop to the head and not from the propeller of a boat. The hearing of the Court of Appeal focused largely on new medical evidence about the injury Jonathan Lewis received. Jonathan Lewis was most probably attacked at the riverbank and not at his house. And he said there was no evidence that his body had ever been in Colin Wallace's car. He says he was the victim of an MI5 dirty tricks campaign. Now Mr Wallace is demanding a full investigation into his claims. Even after Colin Wallace received compensation, his troubles with MI5 were not over. When I was working at BAA, MI5 contacted the head of security there, and uh, then I was made redundant after that. Now, I can't say MI5 was responsible, but again, why were they still meddling in my case after all of those years? The media reported Colin Wallace's appeal and aired his allegations but they did not ask themselves what role they themselves had played in spreading fake news and what lessons they could learn for their reporting in future. Colin Wallace repeatedly called for a full investigation into his claims. But there was to be no full investigation, only an ever longer list of inquiries and legal disputes spanning decades, as the allegations faded from public view. We now look at probably five inquiries that all failed totally to do what Parliament assured the public that it would do. Still to this day, Colin is a problem. That there are major efforts to restrict what he says. King Cor is a prime example. The boys' home where it is alleged intelligence people were involved, recruiting people, used people, etc. The inquiries into that have been incredibly restricted. And Colin on one hand would be told, yes, come and tell us your story, tell us everything. Then when it gets nearer, you get a document from the minister who says, I'm sorry, he can talk about that area, but no way he's going to talk about that. Or MI5, he cannot talk about this area because that gets him into an official secrets area. 
So even to this day, 40 years on, they are still trying to shut him up. The whole system, you see, is unaccountable and it's insidious. Um, it's easy for the MI5 to just say, no, we don't do it, because nobody can prove what they did or they don't. Today, the role the military and intelligence services can play in manufacturing and manipulating the news is considered a conspiracy. Despite extensive press coverage of Colin Wallace's allegations, not a single person in a position of authority has been held to account. When Hugh Mooney of the IRD was asked under oath at a public inquiry about his PSYOP's work, he lied and claimed he was never involved in PSYOPs, despite overwhelming evidence to the contrary. Hugh Mooney walked away, no questions asked, and became a successful businessman. This is a very, very secretive society. It runs through everything. Secrecy is the British disease. It's not anything else, it's secrecy. If you believe in the democratic process, there has to be oversight. And at the moment, we don't have oversight. Because vetting is an important issue for politicians who are looking for ministerial appointments and service people or police officers moving into the higher level, you must have access to classified information. If MI5 don't agree to you having that clearance, if they take that clearance away from you, then your career is doomed. So there, you never know about it. It's an invisible threat that's hanging over people all the time. And therefore the danger is that MI5 has a, almost an invisible degree of influence that really is way outside what it should be. And it's therefore virtually impossible to challenge MI5 on some of the decisions they make. Politicians are careerists, most of them. They want to go up the ladder, become ministers. And if you start criticising or investigating the army or the intelligence services, this will not do your career any good whatsoever. And this is also true for journalists, not a good career path. This is, this is, this is sticky stuff. People are saying, well, why are you fighting with the army and the MOD? Surely you're a part of that. I'm only fighting with the MOD because I was given no choice. They, because the MOD didn't even talk to me. If I hadn't fought when I did, I would probably still have a conviction and I still wouldn't have got the admissions out of the government that we've now got. People realize that the full truth hasn't come out. And although authorities think they may have been clever and been able to dodge around the issue, public have a totally different view. People are pretty aware of when things are not actually truthful. And they know at the moment they haven't had the full truth about what has happened in Northern Ireland. So could you share some of the areas of the troubles that are still closed? I can't say precisely because that would put me in jeopardy. And it would put Colin in deep jeopardy. But there are certain areas of the troubles which haven't simply well, not been talked about at all. You know, there are things about, um, there's a suicide in Northern Ireland of a military intelligence officer. One of the key events it's an official secret. A suicide is an official secret. And so far, no one has written about it. Um, and some of the events around that are appalling, in that he ran agents, agents, who were 14 and 15 year old Catholic schoolgirls. This is how desperate the army at some stage became to get intelligence. And you kind of say, how do you run a 14 year old Catholic schoolgirl? In the story of Colin Wallace, the press helps direct the present by spreading fake news and the media helps digest the past by creating a discussion about the past. The role of departments of the state in creating and shaping reality is not acknowledged. And even after the media has become aware of this, it does not inform the public of the implications of that omission. Power is not held to account. No key decision makers are held to account. And they and their organizations make no admission of wrongdoing. <laughs>
the files that would serve as proof of their actions, either destroyed or hidden. In this story, the press serves as a complex mechanism that helps to reinforce and legitimize power. Allegations of wrongdoing and injustice become lost in inquiries and legal disputes that drag on to this day and that most people no longer understand or believe. We are told that a free press will hold power to account. But what of those individuals and institutions that will never be held to account and have never been held to account? Should the press include that truth in its reporting? Or are some truths destined to be nothing more than versions of fake news? 